Amen. As Corey said, my name is Titus. I get to be a youth pastor here at the North Campus, and it is a privilege to open God's Word with you. So go ahead and get out your Bible and flip to the book of Jude, which is the second to last book in the Bible. And uh, if you do not have a Bible, Alex, come here for a second. Alex will hold up. Uh, we give them away for free. You can just raise your hand, and he can bring a, a Bible to you. Does anybody in the house need a Bible? We give them away for free. There we go, right there. Um, write in it, keep it, underline in it, study it. I'm so glad to be a part of a church that values God's word. Uh, before I get started, I do have one announcement, and that is um, being the youth pastor in April, we are working our way with the youth through a relationship series. So needed for this day and age. Um, and so the guys will be in that hall and the girls will be in that hall. And in here for the month of April, every Monday, we are offering a parenting class. Uh, called A Guide to Biblical Sexuality and How to Talk to Your Children About It. So if you're someone who's like, I would love to talk to my children, I need to just hear some more resources or get challenged in ways to go about that, please come and join us. We will have paid childcare uh, for all ages of students, and um, it'll be every Monday in the month of April. Uh, free, you don't have to RSVP. Uh, so we are in a series called Jude. Contend for the faith, hold the line. And last week, Jim Putman, our senior pastor, talked about how uh, Jude, he was the half-brother of Jesus. Father Joseph, Mother Mary, and yet Jude, along with his brothers, they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, one story, they go to where Jesus is working miracles, and they say, we think he's out of his mind. Uh, but after Jesus raises from the dead, then they put their faith in him, and they're like, yes, Jesus is who he says he is. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah, and they go on to be missionaries, preachers, and teachers. And Jude is writing this letter to believers. And in the beginning, he says, I wanted to, I wanted to write to you about this common salvation. Yes, you're believers, but there's more to enjoy, and I don't want you to miss out on it. He's like, but some, I, I heard something, and so I've got to write this other shorter letter, and it's more urgent, so I'm going to send it right now. And it's, it's this call to contend for the faith. Because uh, what Jude is recognizing in the church is that there are false teachers. In other words, the church was custom to attacks from the outside. I mean, think about Saul before he came, became Paul. He was kicking down doors and arresting mother and father and throwing them into prison until they could be put in trial before the Sanhedrin. And he even oversaw the murder, the martyrdom of the first martyr, Stephen. Right? They were laying cloaks at his feet while they threw stones at Stephen. And so he's like, yes, there are attacks from the outside. But watch out, there's another kind of attack and it's from within. And so we're gonna be reading it today. And if I could just summarize Jude's message, we're gonna be in verses four through 19. Uh, there's a song that we just taught our kids recently that kind of, it reminded me, it goes like this. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Because the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. And I was just thinking, Jude is saying, watch out. Not because he wants to be harsh, but because he's a loving pastor. He loves the sheep, and he's like, watch out. There are going to be people who are false teachers. There's a slide behind me. Not every Bible teacher, not every pastor not every seminary professor is a Christian, or in Jude's word, they're devoid of the Holy Spirit. They take the name, but they don't have the Holy Spirit residing within them. And so he's saying, watch out. And it's a tough message because God not only holds false teachers accountable, but followers too, as we'll see through his example. And so the end of his message is to know God's word so that we can test what we're hearing against God's word. And this can be my filter to say, oh, wait, wait, that doesn't match up with what I'm reading right here. And then to allow people to speak and like, yeah, that, that matches up with what we hear. So he's gonna encourage you to know God's word. So let's begin in verse four. Verse four goes like this. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's these ungodly people who are perverting the grace of our God into sensuality. Let's take a look at that specific text. Uh, they're ungodly. They're not like God. Their acts are not consistent with God's character. It reminded me of this metaphor. My dad, he is a great gardener. 
It's like a super green thumb. And in his living room is a tree because it doesn't grow native to Idaho. So we had to grow it inside the house. And um, if I were to not tell you about its root system, not gonna tell you about the shape of its leaf or the pattern on its leaf, not gonna tell you where it's actually grown, there'd be no way for you to know what type of tree he goes. You can guess it. There's tons and tons and tons of trees, right? But if I were to give you one hint, is there one hint that I could give you and you'd be like, oh, I know what kind of tree that is. I'll give you this one hint. My dad's lemon tree, no joke, in his living room grows Idaho lemons. I know, that's pretty cool. He's lemonade, lemon pie, and it's all from Idaho. Uh, do you know what kind of tree that is? Yeah, no, no one's in here thinking, I need another hint. Tell me about the root system. Tell me about the pattern on the leaves. No one's asking that. Instead, we're like, if it grows lemon, it's a lemon tree. And Jude is saying the same thing. He's saying, you're gonna know these false teachers by the fruit of their lives. Their moral compromise, two ways specifically, their sexual immorality and their greed. It's like, look at their fruit and you know who they are. Because here's what Jude couldn't do. He could start listing the false teaching that was currently attacking the church, but there's so many different types of false teaching that keep on arising. There's no way there's an exhaustive list to all of them. So he's gonna tell us a few things that they've been doing, but more, look at their lives. Look at the fruit of their lives, their moral compromise. So in order to know how something's being perverted, because we read, they're perverting the grace of our God into sensuality. If you're gonna know how it's been perverted or twisted, you gotta know the original. Um, there is a book that's meant a lot to me. It's called The Gospel Primer. It's in your notes by Milton Vincent, encouraging me to preach the gospel to myself daily. And I just encourage you to take on the task of preaching the gospel to yourself daily so that you can know the gospel and so that you can hear it every day as you tell it to yourself. So let's go through a couple things of grace. First, because of grace, what we just sang about, what Corey just celebrated about in communion, I've been declared guiltless of all my sin. And if you're a believer, you've been declared guiltless of all of your sin. And what does that mean? That no more wrath, God has no more wrath for your sin. He had wrath, but Christ completely satisfied it. Like a cup, a cup of wrath. He drank it and then flipped it over and said, to tell us die, it is finished. God's wrath is paid in full. And therefore, God has no more wrath towards my past sin. Sometimes I remember it. I'm like, ah, I can't believe I did that. And he's like, I have no more wrath. Christ satisfied it completely. And God has no more wrath for my future sins. Christ paid for those too. Hallelujah. So in the midst of my sinning now as a believer, because I still sin as a believer, grace is given to me so that I might get back up and aim for righteousness. Hear this and hear it carefully. All of God's commands are for his glory and your good. When he says, thou shall not lie, he's saying, this is good because it builds trust. It, it helps us have good relationship with the Father and good relationship with other people. I'm gonna say it again. All of God's commands are for our good. And so God gives us grace so we can get back up and keep aiming for righteousness. But the false teachers, they pervert it. They twist it. And this is how they do it. Rather than saying grace is the means by which, purchased by Jesus, that I get back up and head towards righteousness, they change the goal. They say, do what you want. And I feel like so much false teaching could be summarized in this short phrase. Do what you want. And then when there's consequences or judgment, you can just say, oh, I get grace. I avoid condemnation. But that's not how grace works, which is why it's called a perversion here. Because when a believer puts their faith in Jesus, God puts the Holy Spirit in them. And I love the Lord and I want to do what pleases him. So when I am sinning, it grieves the Lord. In fact, he disciplines us out of his love. It's not his wrath, it's his love, and it's disciplining me, training me to do righteousness because all of his commands are for my good. And so he puts the Holy Spirit in me, and now I desire to please him. And so with these false teachers, they're devoid of the Holy Spirit. We'll read that later in the book of Jude. They don't have the Holy Spirit, so they don't desire to please him. And so grace has extended us to get back up, but they want a license to have sex outside of God's boundaries. Why it says they pervert the grace of God into sensuality. And sex is like fire. It's powerful and good inside of the fireplace. But God knows that the same thing that's powerful and good inside of the boundaries of the fireplace is a house fire and destructive outside of the boundaries. So he's given these boundaries so that the good can remain good and helpful, 
and not destructive. And yet they say, okay, let's aim for, let's put the aim and use grace as an excuse for outside of God's boundaries. Let's read on. In verse four, it says, they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. The first type of denial that I don't think he's talking about here is that Jesus didn't exist. I don't think that was happening because it was too close to Jesus's time here on earth. My best guess at this denial is that it was a denial of his identity. In other words, who the Bible says isn't really who Jesus was. It's a denial of his identity or a denial of his teaching. What the Bible says Jesus' teaching isn't really what he taught. And by denying his identity, that he is God, but not denying his teaching, these are his commands, they deny his authority and they reject his authority. And if we go down this same path, we begin to remake Jesus in our image, which is heresy, rather than being remade in his image. Think Romans 8. We are to be remade in his image, day by day becoming more and more like Jesus. And so Jude is saying, watch out, these false teachers, they look like shepherds, but they're in it for themselves. That's what leads us into verse five. Go ahead and go there in your scripture. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Let's just pause there for right now. Okay, he's saying, listen, I know you guys, you knew this. You knew God judges those who reject his authority. And, and I know it's not popular even in today's culture to believe that God does judge. He's like, but I gotta remind you of stories not that historically he's judged and future he will judge both the false teachers and those who follow and practice their ways. So careful, caution, be alert and vigilant. And his first example here is that uh, the Israelites. Okay, so the Israelites, uh, they're in Egypt and Jesus, notice his pre-incarnate Jesus, is leading them out and delivering them from slavery. And he takes them through the Red Sea. And I don't think there was any atheist when Jesus is holding back the walls of the water of the Red Sea. No one's like, oh, this is just a windy night, right? Like everybody's like, there's a God. He's powerful. He can do anything he wants to do. But in James, it says even the demons believe in God, but they shudder, right? So, so then they get to Kadesh Barnea, which is on the, the like precipice of going into the promised land. And just like this fruit tells you that it's a lemon tree, the fruit of their actions is about to tell you that they don't really believe that he's good or that he can do it because at Kadesh Barnea, they send the 12 spies into the promised land. They come back, 10 bring a poor report, two bring a good. And the entire congregation is saying, grumbling against Moses and against God, why did you bring us out? It was better back in Egypt, we should go back. God, Jesus here, judges them for their unbelief. And his judgment for their unbelief at Kadesh Barnea is that all of you 20 years and up, your carcasses are gonna be dead across the, uh, the wilderness. And then those that are 20 or below, I'm gonna bring them in. So God judges them in that moment for their unbelief. So he's like, I gotta remind you of this because maybe the false teachers have been teaching there's no judgment. He's like, I don't want you to buy into that. Don't buy into that. Stay true, stay following the good shepherd, Jesus. Let's keep reading, verse six. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Okay, if, if he not only judges mankind, if we reject his authority, he even judges angels who reject his authority. This passage comes out of Genesis six, uh, where it says the sons of God, the angels, they're sleeping with the daughters of men. And so these angels have transgressed God's boundaries. And what I, I love about this passage is it's not like evil's like, oh, is evil gonna win? No, God's gonna win. Oh no, it's back to evil. Instead, the second they transgress, because he is Lord of all, he says, that's it. You're in eternal chains until the gloomy darkness, right? God is sovereign over it. And so Jude's point here is, even the angels he judges when they reject his authority and transgress his boundaries. His third one, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued a natural desire, serve as an example by go, undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Okay, Sodom and Gomorrah, 
it says right here in Jude, they serve as an example. Like a warning, a caution sign to all of us. They serve as an example. And um, the book of Jude is kind of written like an Oreo. If you can see this Oreo up here, double stuffed. Uh, there's a cookie on one end. That's uh, Jim Putman's sermon last week. It's got this encouragement. He's got this encouragement. In fact, uh, Jim Putman preached on this last week. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. In other words, Titus, you need mercy, so may it be multiplied to you. You don't stand and write standing before God because you're holy in and of yourselves. It's only because what we celebrated during communion that you stand in a right relationship with God. The middle is what we're talking about right now. It's a somber warning. Stay alert, stay vigilant. And then Jim Blazin's sermon next week, it says this, go down to verse 22. And have mercy on those who doubt. Okay, so verse two said, you reader need mercy. Verse 22 and 23 says, have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire and to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And Sodom and Gomorrah is it serves as an example of those who undergo punishment. And here it's bookends with these two, kind of like an Oreo that says, first you need mercy in order to be right with God and you are to then to show mercy to those who are sinning either in the same way you sin or who sin differently than you sin. You show mercy, you're snatching them out of the fire because we recognize God, I do not deserve my right standing. I am completely grateful for what your son did on the cross. And so we're both receiving mercy and showing mercy. And he says, God will judge your job, receive mercy, show mercy. Let's go to verse eight. Yet in like manner, okay, these people, talking about false teachers, they're like manner to the previous three stories, also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Okay, so they're relying on their dreams, which let's just get this out right now. Some false teaching can come from a supernatural experience. Doesn't mean it came from God. Look at Ahab with the evil spirit uh, that is sent in order to uh, give him the wrong perception of reality. Don't worry about that. Uh, some false teaching can come from a supernatural experience. And we know that God does speak through dreams. I think of Joseph in the Old Testament. I think of Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I think of Joseph in the New Testament when he's like, yeah, do take Mary, even though she's pregnant. And later on, like, go to Egypt. They're about to kill you, right? God speaks through dreams, but let's make this clarification here, but never in contradiction to the word of God. Okay, never in contradiction to the word of God. And these false teachers are looking at their subjective experiences and they're looking at the Bible through their subjective experience rather than looking at their subjective experience through the Bible. They got it backwards. And so now they start to say, oh, the Bible doesn't say that I had this dream. The Bible doesn't, Jesus isn't really who the Bible says he is. I had this dream or some other subjective experience. And, and Jude is saying, caution, watch out. False teachers are gonna come in and they're gonna say, I'm a Christian too. I'm a Christian too. And they're gonna repeat what the serpent did in Genesis 3.1 where the serpent comes to Adam and Eve and says, did God really say? And he's like, don't, don't buy it, don't follow them. They're not a loving shepherd who lays down their life for the sheep. Let's continue on. I'm in verse nine. But when the, mark, when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, that they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Okay, so uh, there's this story of the archangel Michael, and there's the body of Moses, and there's the devil, and rather than the archangel pronouncing a, uh, a blasphemous judgment on the devil, uh, he says, okay, I'm gonna leave that up to the Lord, okay? This is the Lord. And these false teachers are willing to do something that even an archangel wouldn't do. And it says it's exposing their arrogance and their ignorance, and it's it, they are walking into danger and it's gonna destroy them. And he finishes on this verse. He says, they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. They're giving into their stomach. They say, I hunger for it, so I'm gonna do it. Like we previously, I'm gonna do what I want. I think of an unreasoning, unreasoning animals. I think of like a buck and rut and how we are not like that. 
We have the ability by the Holy Spirit inside of us to say, I desire that, but Lord, you call that sin, therefore I am, I'm gonna walk away like James 2 says. Let's move on to verse 11. Woe to them, or in other words, danger up ahead. For they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. Okay, example number one. He's gonna compare these false teachers to three uh, stories of the Old Testament. The first one, Cain. Who was Cain? Okay, Cain was an unbeliever because he went through the, he went through the motions of sacrifice but he had an unbelieving heart. And when God convicted him or confronted him, rather than repentance, it led him to envy. And his envy led to murder of his brother. And what's interesting is that his descendant Lamech was a lot like he was and also was a murderer. And so uh, what Jude is saying here is, okay, they walked in the way of Cain. They go through the motions of sacrifice. He's like, with an unbelieving heart. And there's nowhere in scripture that says you can just manipulate God by going through the motions. It's not connected to your heart of belief. And read Psalm 51 about how the sacrificial system, even the Old Testament, it had to be connected to their belief and faith in God. It says, watch out. Number two, there's Balaam. Balaam was hired for money to come and pronounce a curse, but God spoke to him through a donkey. How clear does it get through a donkey that don't go do that? That's not what I want to do, you to do. Balaam wants the money. So he figures out a way. He's gonna go talk to the king. Uh, that's the enemy of Israel. And he says, you know, I can't pronounce a curse, but if you get them to uh, sin sexually, he's like, they will reap the consequences of that. And so for money, for money, he leads God's people away, astray, right? And he says, these false teachers, they're doing the same thing. They're doing a financial gain. He's like, watch out. Remember the fruit of their actions that you're looking for, the, the sexually immoral, this license to sin, and then also greed. He's like, watch out for both of those. The third one is Korah. Korah was a Levite, and he didn't like that God had chosen Moses and Aaron to be the authority. Man, even in our day-to-day, -day, submission is such a hard thing to authority, right? And so back then, he's like, I don't like that you two are the authority, and he goes to oppose them, but not just by himself. He convinces 250 other of the well-known tribal leaders in Israel to also oppose them. And God judges him. He opens the earth and swallows Korah. Read it in Numbers 14. And then uh, these 250 people who had followed this false teacher are standing in front of uh, the tabernacle, and fire comes out and consumes the 250. So not only does God judge the false teacher, he judged the 250 who followed him. And Jude is like, watch out that these false teachers don't lead you astray, that you commit sin against God, right? He's like, have this as a filter, know your word. This is a loving shepherd who doesn't want you to be led astray. And he's saying, whoa, danger, not just from without the people attacking the church, but from within. So he starts these pictures. Uh, let's go to the first one. And he's gonna compare the false teachers to five, six uh, different images here. The first one is a hidden reef, but Jude doesn't make the connection for us. We gotta do that on our own. He's like, they're like hidden reefs in your love feast. Or in other words, as you guys eat together at communion, they're like a hidden reef. In what way is a false teacher like a hidden reef? You feel like, oh yeah, we're almost in the harbor. Ooh, smooth sailing from here, and then shipwreck, right? Or damage to what you're doing. He's like, watch out. They're amongst you. And not that Jude wants us to think there's a boogeyman under every rock. He just wants to say, alert, be vigilant. Secondly, let's go to the next one. They're like shepherds feeding themselves. You think of the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Or in Ezekiel, the, the shepherd who chases the strays. Or in Psalm 23, the shepherd who leads them beside still waters. But these shepherds, they're not protecting the sheep from the wolves. They're out there just feeding themselves. They're in it for personal gain. Then he compares them to the next one, the waterless clouds. He says, okay, so Israel is an agricultural community and they needed the rain in order to get the crops to grow, right? Their livelihood depended upon it. And you finally see a cloud and it's coming and you're like, yes, this cloud's coming. Probably darker than that one. And uh, it's coming, 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 coming. And it blows overhead and never drops the rain, right? It's like these false teachers, they give the promise of sustenance which, without ever delivering. Four, 
They're like a fruitless tree, twice dead, uprooted. Okay, so they give the promise of good action without ever delivering because one, this tree is dead because it's autumn and it should be bearing fruit, but it's not. And secondly, not only is it not bearing fruit, but the roots aren't even in the ground. You're not even expecting this thing to bear fruit. It can't gain sustenance and it, it promises good action, but does not deliver. And lastly, Jude compares the false teachers to a wandering star, which if you were trying to navigate on the Mediterranean, it would be impossible to navigate with them because they're so shifty. They're not based in reality and they're not centered in God's word. And so that's what the false teachers are like. Now, because of time, we are only gonna briefly touch on verse 14 through 19, but I do wanna make two main points. Uh, let's read it together. Verse 14, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied saying, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him, these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. There's lots to dig in there, but let me pull out just two main things. First off, don't let it surprise you that there's false teachers. God prophesied long ago that this would be. He knew it. He warned us long ago. He saw it from a long ago that they were gonna be here. It's not a surprise to him, and he's saying it's not, don't let it be a surprise to you. And then secondly, God's going to judge the false teachers. There will come a day where he says, that's it right? But you, dear reader, don't be taken in by their false teaching. We're going to move ahead to verse 17. It's going to say something similar. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. A similar message more recently, well, for us, it's 2,000 years ago, but the apostles made the same claim. They said, okay, there's, there's gonna be false teachers. So first he said, way long ago, they prophesied God knew there was gonna be false teachers. And then more recently, the apostle said, there's gonna be false teachers. Don't let it surprise you. And one last point on this, is these false teachers will be marked by their actions. They're gonna follow their own ungodly passions. There's gonna be three things. Number one, they're gonna try to cause divisions. Just think of Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, where he's like, I pray that you would be one just as the Father and me are one. Like he's hoping, like if you could look at somebody around you randomly, you're like, okay, that we as believers would be one just as God the Father and God the Son are one. That's an incredible amount of unity, right? He's like, I'm praying for that, but these false teachers are gonna try to cause divisions among you. Don't let it happen because the world needs to see a unified church that loves God and loves other people in both word and action. He says, so that's one reason I want you to be alert and vigilant and know your words so you can know when you're like, this book was sold at a Christian bookstore, but this is not, this is not consistent with God's word. This podcast, this YouTube preacher, Lord, they look nice and fancy, but they're not speaking your word because they are disagreeing with you right here, right? He says, be alert. Secondly, they will blend in with the world, or as Jude says, they'll be worldly people. So you're gonna look at them and then you're gonna look at the world and they're gonna kind of match, right? They're gonna kind of like the lines blur between the world and them. Where people who love Jesus stick out like a sore thumb. We do because we're like, I got the Holy Spirit inside of me. So we do things that doesn't make worldly logical sense, if that makes sense. And we, what I hope if any unbeliever comes in here, which I pray they do, they would say something supernatural is here. The way you love each other, the way you took care of him when his father passed away or her as she had a baby, man, that's, that's supernatural. There's something going on, your joy, the fruit of the spirit, your peace, your love for one another. And it points and, and they glorify God because of what they see here done amongst us. We're not meant to blend in the world. We're meant to love the world. And even as Jude said, snatching them out of the fire. And three, they will be devoid of the Holy Spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit. So they don't love him which is why they feel like they can try to use grace in order to do what they want, which is sin. And he's like, don't fall for that. So let's conclude. What's the part that we play in each other's lives to help each other contend for the faith? First, know your Bible. 
Study it. I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion. This is not in Scripture. This is just a Titus suggestion. Okay, you ready for this? My suggestion is read this for more time than you read books that talk about this. Like, there are so many other good books, and I highly recommend them. I did today the, the Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent. But read this one more than you read those so that it can be a filter, like that children's song. Be careful, little ears, what you hear right? So that you can be careful and you can compare it against this. So know it and study it. And if you're a father, invite your wife to study it with you and and, and teach your children because it can be a confusing book. My prayer for you as I drove in this morning was, God, please use scripture to help people see false teaching for what it is. Now, second point in conclusion, I just want you to filter who you listen to and while you listen. Ask yourself, does this match up to God's word? Share your list of who's, who's speaking in your life about the Bible, the Bible teachers and the books you read, because there's two things. One is the category of false teachers, and we definitely need to be like, okay, filtering that out. But the second one are good pastors, good people, which are human, and so their words are not written in red. Does that make sense? So we still, as I go to some of my favorite pastors, I still have to have my mind engaged, and other people can help me see uh, where they might be off or, or there. So I'm not just buying it wholeheartedly. Um, number three, avoid two extremes. <laughs> there are those in the church who want to fight about everything. The carpet color and how many times we repeat a chorus. Don't be that way. Don't fight about everything. We need to be unified, right? And so if it's not a big one worth fighting about, let's not fight about it, right? And then there are the people who won't fight about anything. You're unwilling to hold the line because you know that holding the line could cost you your reputation. Sometimes it makes things awkward at Thanksgiving and Christmas. You, and you, so you're not willing to fight about anything. And I'm just, I'm encouraging you. The word fight is, is so strong, but let's, let's just say we need to fight this fight God's way. And his way of fighting is completely different than the world's. So go about conflict in a biblical way. Last week I did the communion meditation and if you were there, and let's just pretend this is a hypothetical situation. Let's, let's say I was preaching works-based salvation. Obviously heresy, not scriptural. And if I spoke that and you're like, that doesn't sound biblical at all. What should you do? You know, what, what would you do in that moment? You hear me say something that doesn't match up with God's word. I think the first step would be pray about, it. Lord, did I hear that correctly? Maybe go to one person that's godly, like a life group leader, and say, hey, did you hear Titus? Does that sound right? Because I was reading scripture and it doesn't match up with Ephesians 2. And they're like, yeah, I heard that too. And you're like, yeah, okay, pray for me as I go confront him, right? Because I'm not perfect and I need people to confront me when I'm out of line, right? And then you come to me and three things might happen. You, you say, hey, Titus, love you, been praying for you. Last week's communion meditation, I just want you to know that I heard this and I've studied scripture and they're not matching up. Right, your heart is that I might reconcile. And, and so three things might happen. First, I might say, thank you so much for pointing that out. And you might win me over to be like, aha, and now I've got to apologize to you and then go apologize to the entire congregation, right? That would be a win. Or secondly, maybe I say, uh, actually, I didn't intend to say that. I meant to say this, or we, we work around what I was intending versus what, and I could say, oh, I see how you got to that point. Uh, but thirdly and lastly, what if I was just arrogant in that moment and didn't want to receive any correction? I said, Pah. Well, then your next step would go to my authority, which is uh, Jim Blazin, and say, hey, Jim, I, I already tried to confront him in love. I showed him these scriptures, and you'd go on. And that's the way we do biblical conflict resolution in this place. We don't go around to get a whole bunch of people on our side about, Ugh that guy, right? We're going to the person, just like Matthew 18 says, to resolve this Jesus's way. I just think about this number four, the why behind membership class. We spend three hours going over the doctrine so that we know and we're all in stacked hands on the line that we're holding so that it's not just open in the children's hallway who's going to be influencing our children or who's going to be leading the life group. That's one of the reasons we do membership class. And so that if someone says something, you've been in there, you're like, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. Lastly, this is my question for you as we get to worship and then baptize two people, which is super exciting. What shepherd are you following? You know, Jude wrote this with a shepherd's heart. This wasn't to uh, be harsh towards the sheep. 
Instead, if you were a shepherd and there were sheep following you, and then you saw another shepherd over there that you knew wasn't gonna protect them from wolves, and you knew wasn't gonna lead them towards still water and grass, wouldn't you too, as a loving shepherd, say, don't follow that other sheep. Don't follow that other shepherd. Uh, follow, follow this way, right? Follow the true shepherd who is Jesus. So my question, what shepherd are you following? Because Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, uh, go talk to Mike over there. Go talk to Marilyn. Say, hey, I've heard about Jesus. I've heard the invitations open, no matter how much I've sinned, that he is a God who forgives by the power of Jesus' blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that washes me white as snow. Go talk to them and say, hey, explain that. Pray for me. What's my next step? We'd love for you. Would the rest of you uh, stand up and worship the Lord with us?